come, someone turn on the lights over there. The one in the middle, yeah, thank you. Okay, so if there are any questions here. For our friends who are online, please let me know if uh, you have any problem with the song. Just send an email to questions at francislucille.com. And also, if you have questions, send a question there. If you have sent a question <coughs> earlier on, please email it again. If you have put a question on the Meetup uh, page, uh, please uh, email it. The only way to ask questions is, li is to ask them live and uh, by sending an email. If you have uh, difficulties uh, with this uh, webcast, it may be, it's likely to be because of your, the bandwidth of your internet connection or the quality of it. So you may perhaps uh, check that. If you receive, um, we usually send the the link uh, like uh, two hours before or three hours before the event. So don't worry if you don't receive it before. The fact that you have RSVP'd on the meetup group at Vita means that you will that we will send the link to you. The two major reasons why you don't receive it is either because it, go, it gets trashed into your spam folder, so you have to take the appropriate steps not to have the messages from Meetup trashed, or because you have uh, chosen not to receive emails from Meetup uh, in your meetup preferences, or because the address, the email address, which is on file with meetup, is not current. These are the three reasons why you wouldn't receive the link. Uh, after having RSVP'd yes uh, for this for the event. Beginning next week, we have a slightly different policy with that. We will have two distinct events on Meetup, one for which will be the regular event and one which will be for the scholarships. So the regular event will be shown ahead of time. You will be able to RSVP ahead of time and the scholarship will be will be uh, 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 released 24 hours more or less before the event, and you will get an email message with the information that the, co the scholarships have been released. So nothing to worry about. Also, you'll receive it. And thank you for those who whose donations help us. Uh, uh, pay for the expenses of our 
equipment or internet connection and for the the service provider for uh, the broadcasting of the video in high definition to you. Um, now we come to the questions. There is a question here. Yeah. Uh, yes. My question, Francis, <coughs> is about the uh, it, it's about the uh, the yoga the, that we do, and um, I I'm accustomed to thinking that I store experiences and and ignorance in the sense we use it here. Um, in my in my mind in my in in my mind in my memory, but the idea that we somehow store these experiences and uh, ignorance in our bodies in the body is 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 something somewhat new to me, and I wonder if you if you could um, satisfy my curiosity about. How this go? How that comes about? It's not only experiences. It's uh, attitudes, behaviors. Uh, when I sometimes, if I see one of my children, I look at them, and I could see some expression or a way to smile or a way that looks exactly like my father. Are you following me? Yes, yes. Meaning that something got transmitted, perhaps in part through the genes, of course they look a little bit like my father, but there is something else. There is something that, we, that gets transmitted through pure imitation that obviously as a very young kid, you know, looking at my father, even without being aware of that, my body in its, in its behavior, in its attitude was imitating my, imitating my father's. And my child did the same with me. So then there was a transmission of these behavioral patterns, you know, uh, uh, and uh, most of those are innocent. You know, a smile, a way to smile, a way, uh, an intonation in the voice. A lot of those are just, uh, 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 just nice stuff. Now, just as the nice stuff can get transmitted, the not so nice stuff that relates to ignorance is transmitted in similar ways. In other words, if If I am depressed, if I am angry, if I am under constant pressure, if I am under subjected to intense fear, deep inside, uh, repressed fear, there are uh, uh, attitudes that go with that that I'm not aware of necessarily. They are kind of subconscious. But they are kind of visible, and uh, the child, in his innocence, is like a white page, and all of that gets absorbed and printed in. In other words, it's not that <coughs> ignorance, we inherit it just at the time when we are able to think and to, to talk through an intellectual, verbal uh, transmission, we begin inheriting it much earlier on, before we can even formulate concepts, even possibly before we can formulate the, the I concept. So then, these, all these mechanisms of feeling separate, feeling isolated, 
have already, so to speak, warmed up the house and kept the light on for ignorance to 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 uh, uh, sleep there. And uh, so this is how it works. Regarding these uh, uh, um, attitudes that are often uh, uh, subconscious that express uh, uh, a psychological uh, uh, state, uh, I mean, this is v very clear to, to us. You know, we know that from our parents. We knew when they were angry. We knew from in, in our uh, 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 close uh, 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 parent when when something is wrong. They don't need, need to tell us anything. Then you go, is there anything wrong? <laughs> Did I do something wrong? Uh, or, or you look at tennis players and as they change sides, the one who is getting a, 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 a spanking, you can see the way they walk, the, the, the head is down, you know, and the one who is just <laughs> winning, he's just walking like this. <laughs> they are not aware of their body language, but uh, so that corresponds to patterns. We have patterns that relate to the way the body moves, smiles, breathes, very important, the, the, the way it breathes. And we have patterns that relate to our, the postures we take. So static patterns and dynamic patterns. And, 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 and really the, the, the establishment, you know, in this is the, is the liberation from these patterns. And, and um, you know, when I was looking at my teacher, he was beautiful, you know. I, I, I was looking at his hands, at his smile, and, his, and there was something so... Uh, I, I couldn't, you know, uh, describe it, but there was something. And in fact, it was this freedom, that the freedom was not in the words, that as much as it was... At, as it was in the body. There is this beautiful uh, passage in um, this book by Hermann Hesse that many have read, Siddhartha. And in this story, uh, his hero, or in his uh, character in the book, meets Gautama, the Buddha. And what he focuses on is the hand of the Buddha. And, and the freedom that is expressed in the hand. You, you remember this passage? So that shows that the, 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 the liberation was not just at the level of concept, but that it had uh, kind of permeated the entire structure. Yes, I, I'm understanding. It makes, it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I can see now how it's like... Uh, their um, their attitudes that are acquired by being impressionable and in the proximity of uh, of someone that uh, we admire deeply or yes yes and 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 and, and that's also yes and 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 it works both ways it is in the same way as we have acquired it from our parents that we kind of, I mean, they were the only game in town to admire, right? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> and to imitate. And, and so, so we have acquired the good stuff and also the, the, the not so good stuff from them. But not only from our parents. There is a story that, that I have told many times, but. Uh, I was, I was three years old and on the beach and uh, I saw all of a sudden a group of people, of adults, uh, surrounding something I couldn't see. But at the time, and they were saying something in French, a noyer, a noyer, a word I'd, I had never heard, a word I couldn't understand. So 
I couldn't see anything. I was hearing these words in French. But at the same time, I felt an intense bodily sensation that uh, an intense panic take hold of me. An intense panic. And this panic was without the, the slightest reason. Be because, number one, I didn't understand the word. Number two, all these legs of adults, of this group of people, I couldn't see what they were surrounding. The word noyer in France means a, a, a drowned person, a drowned body. So somebody had drowned and they had pulled the body on the, on the beach and they were around it. And what I was getting was all the vibration of fear of death from this group of people. You see? It, 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 and and it, it wasn't until much later, uh, so later on, at some point, I, of course, pretty soon I understood what a noyer meant, you know, when I was four, perhaps, or, <laughs> or perhaps right after the event, I don't remember. But much, much later, this event came back to me, as I was a truth lover, with all the implication and all the, the, the this, because at the same time, I felt this panic in me, but at the same time, I felt how strange, you know, that you have, yeah, that you are experiencing this panic where, where it's in fact, there is nothing to be afraid of that I could think of. It was, it was a, an objectless fear, a fear without a cause, at least without a cause that I could see or understand, which was quite unusual. And I guess then that it follows that when we, when we do our consciousness yoga, um, that, and we move our bodies and imagine our bodies um, expanding or are doing things that we are not accustomed to them doing, um, that we're trying to reverse or release some of that. That's we are trying first to reveal those, to become aware of those. That's the first step. To to bring to the surface to the surface the immersed part of the iceberg, if you will. And I guess it's possible that physically um, we might be just aware of a, a certain stiffness or Absolutely. or inability to to easily assume a particular it's not that much. The, the, it's more that we are kind of aware of some dark area in us that is too, too dark for us to look at it. We don't want to look in this direction. It's a, it's, it's a sense of, of doom, you know? A sense of uh, something is wrong at a very deep level. But I... If I look there, I may die, you know, I, I, something terrible may happen, so I don't want to, to look there. And then, after I have looked there and gone through it, then it's different. Then what you have there are just residues, and these residues um, you have no problem looking at them. Uh, if you will, uh, no basic problem. But they still, for some time, have some unpleasantness. So the idea is to welcome them so that they can empty themselves from this unpleasantness. And at some point they are just bodily sensations without the attached unpleasantness. 
So the unpleasantness is a psychological charge which is superimposed onto the sensation. What is important is to recognize some of these sensations for what they truly are. For instance, in my case, I had sensations that were definitely psychological sensations, but they were located in, in, the, in the neck area, these this muscles, this thing. And by, if I do some movement, if I do, for instance, this movement, or the movement like this, and then this movement, and I keep these muscles like that, I will, this, the same sensation will come up, will manifest. Mm -hmm. But this time it's very different. It's just a muscle mm -hmm. which is working, which is in a position which is not usual, and which after a while of staying like this uh, 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 requires me to, to relax it because it's getting, it, it starts burning. So, but it is the same thing. So by doing it like this, I can remember that there are moments when I have the same sensation, but it's just, it was just psychological at the time. It was interpreted as unpleasantness. Are you following me? So, so that if you, like that, one of the ideas of the Hatha Yoga is that you know your body, you know all, you have explored, explored all the nooks and crannies of the body, and so if you know everything, you know that everything is just a bodily sensation. Mm -hmm. If you have recognized the bodily sensation as such, it becomes very much more difficult to see it as a psychological feeling. You see, because then it has been, it has been uh, uh, spotted out, if you will. I see the, the method for dismantling it. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. That's one of the methods. Yeah. There, there are many uh, uh, skillful means, you know, that are being used by teachers. Many of them they have inherited. Uh, what is nice if you have a, a teachings that comes from various traditions is that there are more tools at the disposal so that some tools are better suited to some, some cases, etc. It's like having more screwdrivers <laughs> instead of just having a kitchen knife, yes. you see. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, but a lot of these skillful means, all of them boil down to the same at the end. So there is a lot of, mm, they intersect each other they, they, to a very large extent, so you don't need to master all of them. But if you master a few of them, by the same token you master all of them, you know, that's the idea. Thank you very much. I, I understand now. Thank you. And regarding um, this uh, aspect of um, of the teachings that relates to 
to the body, if, if the body, what is important is for the body to live the teaching. It is, it is important to understand the teaching, but it is even more important for the body to live the teaching. It's like, uh, it may be important to, to learn the theory on how to play the violin, but it's uh, still more important for the body to play the violin. I wouldn't go to a concert of someone who has never played the violin and understands the theory of how to play the violin. I'd rather go to someone who knows how to play the violin and doesn't know much about the theory of it. With regarding uh, with re with regard to those exercises, I usually feel a general overall resistance to doing the exercises rather than a, any particular reaction to any one exercise. And I'm wondering what's going on there. Well, is the resistance may be of two kinds. It may be either an intellectual resistance. An intellect, for instance, an intellectual resistance would be of the kind. Well, that's yoga. It's not Advaita. It has nothing to do with Advaita. Advaita has nothing to do with the body. Uh, Advaita is a direct path. I understand it, and that's it. Then I am as miserable as before, but it doesn't matter because I have understood it. <laughs> so, that's basically Western Advaita, if you will. <laughs> and, and because in the West we, we want instant gratification. So the part of the direct part that has, has been really uh, understood by uh, 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 Western Advaita is the instant gratification part. You see. So then the resistance will be, yeah, that's not Advaita, so wha what am I doing here? You know, this guy doesn't know what he's doing in the first place, and uh, so I'm leaving. So that would be an intellectual resistance. Now, you may come here, ask questions, and at some point, you may be kind of convinced that, convinced intellectually of the process. And then something different takes place, is that at that point, you really are eager. There is an eagerness in you to, to conduct these experiments. They are not really exercises, they are more experiments. To conduct these experiments and to see how it goes. And as you begin with this, uh, uh, at that point, the, the, the resistances at the level of, of the intellect, if you will, have been erased by appropriate conversations, appropriate investigation. Now, what you are facing now is something else. You are going into the heart of the matter. So what you are facing are the real, uh, uh, um, the real, uh, uh, how can I say, little devils are uh, that in the bodies that are coming out of the woodwork. And uh, that which is, it's, it's a kind of a taming process. It's a tam the taming of the little devils. The little devils are the resistances. And uh, the it's uh, th they are best dealt with spatial uh, spatial temporal patience 
In other words, you give them not only time, but space. You give them, you give them the, the whole space-time continuum to do their gig. Without, without seeing them as a problem, as something to get rid of, but rather with some kind of, you know, joyful curiosity, like you, you, you have a, a new particle d uh, recently discovered and you want to, to know all its characteristics, all its, all its properties. You know the mass, but you don't know yet the spin, etc. So you, you want to, and uh, you are eager to find out whether it matches the, the theory, whether it is a real thing or not, although the mass gives you a good indication. You are getting my drift, right? I, I think I have <coughs> absorbed a lot of the um, attitude in fundamentalist Christianity that the body is an impediment to salvation rather than an agent for salvation. Yeah. And uh, it's not that the body is an agent of salvation, no, an impediment. The body is really a victim <laughs> of ignorance. So you want to, to liberate the, the, the body and to liberate the mind from ignorance. Mm -hmm. Th this liberation is, 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 is like a form of implosion which is similar to a, to a pebble falling in the middle of the pond and then gradually the, the ripple, the wave, uh, uh, travels throughout the entire surface of the pond. And it is the same. It, it begins at the very core of our being by, by some very deep glimpse of truth. And then everything gets eventually uh, 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 affected by it. So it is this wave of freedom that we have to allow to propagate throughout the body and throughout the mind. Throughout the mind, it's easy in your case. Throughout the body, it's, it's, um, this uh, attitude of rejection with regard the, uh, of the body is not, uh, not solely uh, part of the, of the Western traditions, you you have some in the in the Indian traditions, even in the, in the Advaita tradition, in the kind of scholastic Advaitic tradition in India, you can see often this this body is a bag full of bone, excrements, urine, and a few other things. Uh, uh, so it's not a very a nice picture of the body. You you have that also in Buddhism. It, it's this contempt for the body instead of seeing the body for the divine creation it is, in fact, the divine instrument it is. I, I, I prefer, I mean, in our tradition, we prefer very much the artistic view of the, of the body, you know, the artists, the fine arts, you know, the, the human body is seen as a marvel. And, and the painters, you know, in those traditions, or, or the sculptures, the Greeks, the, the, the Italians, etc. They, they had this great uh, awe for the human body. The, this contempt for the body seems to be stored in the body itself, not so much in the mind. The, the way is to release the body uh, to the custody of its true owner. It 
the, the tone of the body is the self, is, is the divine. And so the divine knows how to take care of it. So, and the, and the divine in us is the presence in which the body appears. So the, the, the general approach of it is to constantly release the body to the presence. And the presence is consciousness, meaning we don't want to keep the body away from consciousness. We don't want not to feel the body. We want to allow ourselves as a first step to feel the body, not to, to escape the body and to go into thought, etc. For some of us, it may be good to, as an exercise, to intentionally rebalance the attention between the two realms, between the realm of thought and the realm of bodily sensation. Some of us live a lot in their thoughts. So it may be interesting to come down to earth, in a sense, to come back to the body by, by doing very simple exercise like sensing the hands or sensing the legs, sensing the soles of the feet, sensing the back of the head. There are zones in the body that, are, that we are ignoring somehow. And these uh, hidden areas, uh, in India they would call them tamasic areas, uh, are the favorite hiding places for ignorance. These are the all the residential real estate of ignorance. And the body also seems to be the home of a lot of desires. Well, The body has needs. I think the desires are more um, uh, the, the, I mean, there are two kinds of desire, but, but the needs are, are not a problem. The the The, the, the desire that comes from ignorance is addictive desire. Addictive desire is a desire that corresponds to not to a real need, but to an attempt to escape our sense of lack. For instance, uh, I've eaten enough, I'm no longer hungry, but I'm going to eat twice as much again, uh, still because uh, then I, I feel full. Uh, and so this type of thing, or I'm going to, to smoke a pack of cigarettes because I feel that then I am relieved. And in these moments of relief, of fullness, I, I feel, and of course I am deluding myself in doing so, I feel that I have at least temporarily uh, mm, filled up this sense of lack in me. So these are the desires that are problematic. And usually we c they, are th they are based, not always, they are, but in some cases they are based upon a natural need. But they, they exaggerate it. They overuse it. It can be overeating, it can be oversexing, it can be over, over something. Yeah, 
even over exercising. Yeah. And and the uh, when do when you go over it's at some point it's not enjoyable or at least there is a, a price to pay for it. But the needs are something different. The need for we have a, we have a physical needs for food, for shelter, for water, air, and we have a, a more subtle needs such as need for company, social needs. You know, to be w- to, to to meet with other human beings. We are kind of pack animals, and and so these are needs that are wired in the body. And then there is something else, there is a different category of desire, which is impersonal desire, which is desire for celebration. And desire uh, for the difference that desire for celebration are harmless and they come from happiness itself. And uh, they can be shared, desire to have a, a nice meal with friends, desire to play music with friends, desire to listen to music, desire you know, uh, to play tennis or whatever. I'm using a few examples uh, randomly, but the everything we, we do, which is very innocent, out of this freedom, out of this uh, cel- sense of celebration is not doesn't come from ignorance. So we have to be careful not to identify uh, desire and ignorance. There is this French philosopher Pascal, and mathematician and physicist also. And he's someone who who had an enlightening experience, definitely. But at the same time, and as a result, he became very, very uh, uh, um, a mystic and devoted a lot of his energy to to God within the Catholic religion, of course. And uh, it was the only game in town at the time. But somehow, he says something very wrong, and you will, you will see why, in my case, I find it wrong. He talks about the distraction. He talks about how we do things just not to think about God. And uh, he takes the example of this, this guy playing the jeu de pomme, which is jeu de pomme, that was the tennis at the time. And his contention is that they are just playing tennis, not just jeu de pomme, in order to avoid thinking of God. That may, may be well the case, but there is another possibility he's not mentioning that they are playing it just out of celebration, out of happiness. So now, not out, not in order to avoid God's presence, but just the opposite, to celebrate God's presence, because God is everywhere. He's, God is also in the little yellow ball. So, we cannot tell from any activity that seems to arise out of a desire, we cannot tell a priori whether it arises out of ignorance or out of celebration or out of need. It's for each other of us to, to see within. And 
one way to, to, to see it clearly regarding the desire that arises out of celebration is that there is no attachment. You cannot fulfill it, so be it. Because it is just like the icing on the cake. It's not in and by itself that important. Today it rains. God doesn't want me to celebrate playing tennis. I'm going to play some music. You see what I mean? It's what is meant today, no problem. My happiness is not depending on it. Or dependent on it. A, de a desire that arises out of need uh, is a little more tricky, isn't it? Because that arises out of out of need, uh, because the need has to be satisfied. In yeah, but it's not that tricky because you do your best to satisfy it. The the the, the desire that there is not really a desire ari arising out of need. There is just a need. The need in and by itself is a tension towards uh, the fulfillment of this need. Uh, the difference is that with regard to a need, there are only practical issues involved. Let's say I've been walking on the plateau or somewhere, I'm thirsty. I have to make decisions. I have, I have no water left. Do I keep walking or do I come back to the base or whatever? You see what I mean? These are just practical decisions when you will face a need. There is a cost. Analysis to be made. It's just practicalities. Is that is a need? Uh, coming from the same sense of lack that a desire for more to eat, I, don't know, I mean, more th to eat no, than I need. No, because the, the huge difference is that whereas the desire that comes from ignorance is an endless process, the need once the need, the need has been satisfied, it's over. If I'm thirsty, I drink. It's over. If I drink too much, water becomes disgusting. You see what I mean? My body knows exactly. So then it's over. It's been dealt with. I need, uh, it's cold. I need some warm stuff. I put a sweater on. End of the problem. Now, sometimes it's a little more difficult. I have a pain somewhere. I need to go to the dentist. It takes a little longer, especially on weekends. <laughs> because I don't know whether you have noticed that toothaches they always start on Fridays. <laughs> I mean, dentists, they must be full on Fridays, you know. <laughs> It's a law. Well, uh, physicists should have take a look at this kind of laws of nature. <laughs> the the sense of lack is that strictly psychological, or is there is more to it than that? Isn't there? It's not psychological in that sense. And the sense of lack is a separation from God. That's it. That is hardly psychological. So that's a part that Pascal, he had it right in that sense. Everything that, any activity that comes out of this sense of lack is a distraction. Any activity that comes from the presence of God, any activity that comes, let's put it in a kind of mathematical formula, any activity that comes 
out of the absence of God is a distraction, and the activity that comes out of the presence of God is a celebration. I think it's, it's complicated to, uh, to see clearly whether it's a, a sense of life that comes out of the absence of God. If there is, I, did, uh, I think it's difficult to see clearly whether a sense of lack comes from a feeling of absence of God rather than absence of something else. Let's say absence of a, a or let's say from a social need. Hmm. Well, I don't, I don't think so, because uh, if you apply my criterion, when you, when you, when you, if you are thirsty, when you, you drink water, that's it, you have it. So the, the, the quality of a need is that usually there are very simple ways to, to fulfill it at its basic level, talking about the needs of the body. And so, as a result, if a sense of lack can be fulfilled, then it was a need. But if a sense of lack is unfulfillable forever, then that you, you, you have people who are wealthy, healthy, young, rich, whatever, uh, uh, and they commit suicide. You know, they are, they are totally depressed. So that's the that, that, example of a, And it's not uncommon. It's, it's very, very, very frequent to see that. This uh, deep in, uh, spiritual misery. All forms of miseries, of all forms of miseries, by, by far the spiritual misery is is the deepest and the worst. The rest is nothing. I, w I was born in a, in a level of poverty that is unthinkable nowadays in, in our countries. And I could see that my parents, my mother, for instance, she was born in a level of poverty which was 10 times the one I was born to. And somehow, the level of misery was not, it, there was a level of misery, they were in ignorance. But uh, in today's America, with a level, of, a great level of comfort and much lesser misery, you have much deeper levels of psychological, spiritual uh, despair. The, the, the real misery is spiritual. The rest is very little. You can see uh, monks or nuns who are completely devoted to the divine and, and they, they live in a real misery in, in, in a sense compared to what they don't have a car, they don't have, a, they have just a little place to, to stay, a little bed. They work hard, they, 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 they live in difficult conditions, no heating, etc., no heating system, they, they have to carry the water, and they are light-hearted and happy. Because there must be something wrong in our Western uh, materialist view of, of happiness. Uh, 
Um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the psychological charge that you were talking about. So, hypothetically, let's say I'm in a situation and I start to feel annoyed. And sometimes I'm able to sort of go more introspectively and go, okay, well, what's happening in the body at this point, oh, that's interesting. My neck is tense at the same time that I have these thoughts around being annoyed. When is the, the work done? Is it to almost um, short circuit the causation and, and the feeling of being annoyed leaves and it's just the, the external situation occurs, there's a recognition of the bodily pattern and that's just interesting, or is it that the thoughts of annoyance will still occur, the bodily sensation will still occur, but you're just aware of that and not reacting to that? It, it's it, it, it comes with a recognition of the, the early recognition of the I thought. And then, later on, the early recognition of the I feeling that triggers the I thought. If we let the I feeling out of the box, then it triggers the I thought. In turn, if we let the I thought out of the box unchecked, then it triggers other I thoughts that in turn trigger big emotions, such as anger, frustration. So that's way down the road, you see. If, I mean, if the I am find myself in an explosion of anger. It's not that it's not only that the cat is out of the box, it's that the cat was out of the box a long time ago, and in the meantime it has proliferated a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so so the There is, once we have been made aware that the source of our misery is our infatuation with the I thought and the I feeling, that we, we are aware of the danger it represents, that if, if we board this train, if we agree, it will take place, it will take us to a, a place which is not nice. And uh, then be, we become more cautious as the seemingly cute I thought arises, not to go along with it. And then the, 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 and then the, the impulse at the feeling level that triggers the I thought is so quick. It's, it, 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 it's a bodily sensation. Now, how we, that gets resolved is by not, by being aware of it and releasing it at its earliest possible stage. It's a, it's a kind of, there is a first impulse, then there is the I thought, then there is the the succession of how did he dare do that to me and then there is the anger, the frustration. And we can become aware earlier and earlier on and as a result we drop it. And as we drop it, as we become aware of it, all the consequences are, are erased, you see. And since all the consequences are, are erased, because they don't repeat themselves, 
the habit gets weakened. And since the habit gets weakened, next time I will become aware even more earlier on, on the process. All of that explains how that happens provided we are open to the possibility that consciousness is universal. Because as long as we believe consciousness to be personal, we cannot pretend that the I thought and the I feeling are liars. You see? Because in fact we believe them. We cannot simultaneously claim that they are lying and believe them. We have to make our choice. Or at least, we have to be open to the possibility that they are lying to us. So, and this takes place the moment we have investigated our belief that they are true. And discover that we have no valid reason to believe that they are telling us the truth. The, the I feeling and the I thought as a separate person. So the, 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 first, the first item on the agenda, if you will, is to this investigation, which we do here, of the nature of consciousness. And then, you know, you attend retreats, dialogues like this one. At some point, you truly feel, yes, it makes sense. You are truly open to this new possibility. And then you are willing to apply it, and in particular, to apply it to your feeling process and, and thought processes, to try a different way. So I, I think I may not be understanding the concept of the I feeling correctly. Is the I feeling... It's not a concept. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's that which triggers the I concept. Before but I think I, mm -hmm. as a separate person, there is often, th this I as a separate person doesn't come in general out of thin air there is a kind of contraction that triggers it. They have this beautiful uh, 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 expression in, in, in the Indian tradition. They call it the, the knot of the heart. So the, the, the I thought comes out as a separate person, out of the knot of the heart. Yet that the heart and, and it means that the heart is not free, that the heart is constricted somehow. But in essence, that is a bodily sensation, that, yes. that knot of the heart. Yes. And presumably, there needs to be a thought which is, that is me, separate me. Yes, it, 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 kind is, is, it serves as evidence for the I thought as a separate me. It is me first as this sensation, and then me as this concept, as being this body. This, this thing is me as this body, in, this, in a sense. Me as this body. Me localized here. You, you, you can see when, when, the, when, the, when you think of me, another way to look at it is this. Become aware, whenever you think of me, whether you are thinking of me, me consciousness, as being in the body, or whether you think as the body being in consciousness. 
In fact, you have these two options. Every time you think of consciousness being in the body, then you are listening to the not in the heart. Every time you think of consciousness as of, of the body being in consciousness, then you are kind of free of that, free from that. Perhaps what I'm trying to understand is, is it important as to whether that knot of the heart continues to exist? Because anything that is an identification must be a thought, I'm thinking. So at, at essence, maybe it doesn't matter whether that bodily sensation continues to exist, or is it important that... Um, the knot of the heart in its is more than a bodily sensation. It is the identification of consciousness with this bodily sensation. So there is a thought included in that? No, not oh. a thought. There is, I mean, there might be a nice thought, but then in this case, it is the identification of consciousness with a nice thought. The thing is, ignorance at its very, at its, deepest level is the identification of consciousness with an object, with a perception. Consciousness is not a, uh, ignorance is not a perception. It is the identification of, of consciousness with a perception, which is not the same thing. But is a thought required for identification, I guess, is my question. An object is required for identification. In the absence of objects, there is no identification. But in the absence of thoughts, I would think perhaps there's no identification also. If the, uh, yes, there can be identification with a perception, with a, with a sens bodily sensation. But doesn't there have to be some sort of thought that goes, oh, there's a sensation of a finger tapping a finger, that's me, and that is, is a thought process that goes through, well, that is, that is a thought, is it, I would think. Yeah, in that sense, yes. But you can have also, just as, just as there might be a thought prior to identifying with a bodily sensation as in the example you just mentioned, the converse can be true. That there is a bodily sensation prior to a thought identifying with the body. It starts with something here, a gut feeling, I'm this, and then I as this body, then the picture of me, uh, like on my passport, picture comes in, etc. My personal story, my name. But, uh, you have to, what I'm saying is very simple. Find when you think I, find where, whether it has a, a localization. Where the, where the, whether the thought I, the concept I, to you seems, seems to point to localization in the body, either in the forehead or in the in the chest somewhere, and and it means in that case that there is an object that impersonates I, and this object, of course, is kind of localized, limited, etc. Or if you think I. Do you think just consciousness without limits, you know? Does it, where does it lead for you, you see? And that's another path to replace, when you think I, this localized, that's a part of the, of the yogic path, but to systematically 
replace the localized I with a non-localized version, a non-local I, in order to erase this habit. They have a, in the Indian tradition, I, I don't remember, it's somewhere, I mean, in this yogic path, they have all these Mahavakya, you know, and, 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 and systematically you can go through various stages in one, one in which you, you remove the localization, you, you are identifying with the space, and then the space itself has to go at some point. So even that is still a kind of a residual identification. Every time you can find the I as an object, it's the wrong I. That's all. That's the one way to put it. Don't find the I. The I has to remain unfound. Then it is the right place. If you find the I, you are cooked. Well, we may have some questions here online. Okay, Elizabeth Renninger was with us, with us at the retreat. Uh, since returning from your retreat, I have noticed a sweet current of all is well, a sense of deep and joyful contentment, which is rather distinct, unique in its flavor, from anything I can recall experiencing previously. It's really excellent, to say the very least. At the same time, I'm even more acutely aware of what I assume to be emotional body vasanas, characterized by feelings of sadness or anxiety or anger. Sometimes I can associate these feelings with specific events or circumstances, and sometimes not. As I notice these feelings, vasana, slash vasanas, I can fairly easily tune into the sweet contentment current which I imagine to be the space within which they are arising. It's kind of strange experiencing sadness and joy simultaneously, or anxiety and joy simultaneously. But this is what seems to happen in such moments. So, I am wondering first if you have any comments about this. Or suggestions about how best to relate to these vasanas, other than what I've just described. Uh, what you are describing is a part of some yogic approach, and it's a good idea to do it, but only for as long as your heart is with it. In other, in, in other words, do it as much as you can do it being interested in doing it. Never become, make, never get mechanical about it. Uh, it's better to do it well, uh, in depth, for shorter period of time, and then see where your desire for celebration takes you next. Uh, and then you can resume later on. Basically do this only, only also if you have, if you are experiencing this sadness or anxiety, etc. But not 
with the desire to stay with it until the sadness or in the anxiety dissolves. Because if you do that, you still remain focused. You still remain focused on the negative side. Use that. Use the sadness or the anxiety rather as a, a springboard from which you can jump into the space that surrounds it and which is happy. But then you don't need to gravitate for too long around the sadness. Take a trip to a happier planet. Um, so these are my comments. She says, I also feel curious sometimes about the possibility of this sense of sweet contentment just being one of many stations on the radio of Elizabeth's body-mind, rather than the space within which all such stations appear. How would I know for sure one way or the other, one way or another? Well, um, if this sense of sweet contentment has still a, a bodily component to it, in other words, it's like the perfume of a rose, the rose being a bodily sensation, and the perfume being the contentment. But still being attached to the sensation in the way the perfume of the rose seems to be attached to the rose, whereas, in fact, yes, attached but not identical with it, attached but al already at some distance from it. So that would be the metaphor I would use. Allow for the rose to detach itself more and more from the perfume. Stay with the perfume. Stay as the perfume. So that the, 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 the bodily component of it becomes irrelevant, that you can discriminate still between a happy body, if you will, and the happiness itself, in which it arises and that permeates it. But it's good news what you are telling me. Will and Dana, Will asks, you have said in one of your internet dialogues that an intellectual understanding that corresponds to a sudden fleeting recognition of our true nature brings us a flash of pure joy. But when we have full knowledge that we are not the body, we are that joy. Based on experiential evidence, I know I am not the body, but I still sometimes have the sense that the body is a vehicle for awareness, driving it around as it were from here to there. I know that awareness is not in the body, that the body is in awareness, is awareness, but things seem to be switching back and forth. It appears that I don't have full knowledge that I am not the body. 
Do you have a suggestion as to how to approach this dilemma? Yes, Will, even in your question, you have been switching back and forth between the two. Because you say, I know I am not the body, so you are on one side, but I have the sense that the body is a vehicle for awareness driving it around. In that, in that case, you are in the body, so you are dependent on it. Then you say, I know that awareness is not in the body, but things seem to be switching back and forth. So, You know, the suggestion as to how to approach this dilemma is the investigation. You have to go deeper with your investigation until your conviction gets stronger. Uh, and in these moments, I would say this, in these moments when you don't believe to be a separate consciousness, just don't do anything, just enjoy, celebrate. Taste these moments. Recognize these moments, if there are such moments. And in these moments, be free, do whatever, follow your, your sense of celebration in the moment itself. Whatever it suggests for you to do, do it. It may be, it may be something trivial, it may be something not spiritual at all, like, I don't know, going for a walk or going to the liquor store and buy uh, some beer because it's, co it's, it's very hot today, whatever. And that's what you, are, you fancy at that moment, or watching a football game. Uh, do whatever in these moments you feel like doing. But in these moments when you believe otherwise, and the detector for that is that you feel constricted, restricted, you feel not free, then investigate in this moment, in these moments. In this way, and the, the investigation will take you back to the openness. In this way, the moments when you are on one side of the swing, if you will, will become longer. In fact, if we use the metaphor of the swing, there is a stable position of the swing, which is when it stops swinging, which is at the minimum of potential energy. And uh, then the unstable positions are the ones in ignorance. As you swing back and forth, especially when you are at the, at the highest point in the swing being motion, which means when you experience the deepest misery, that's when you have to investigate. By doing so, you take energy out of the swing, if you will, and you move towards its stabilization. Pasia asks, yesterday you mentioned that when we experience misery, we can investigate it. Yes, I just <laughs> mentioned it. It seems to me that this choice to investigate must arise in consciousness. Yes. However, from ignorance, we claim the choice. Is that correct? But we can claim it also from knowledge, since the choice 
really arises out of our true nature. It never arises out of ignorance. So, we are always correct when claiming, or assuming at least, that it arises out of our true nature and not of, of ignorance. And then she goes on, and if all choices arise in consciousness, then is there anything we can do in ignorance or does it only appear that we have choice? If we are in ignorance, we have to understand what we mean by we, when we say we are in ignorance. When we say we are in ignorance, what we, we mean by we is the real we, otherwise it has no meaning. It has to be the real we. So the real we in ignorance is consciousness being in ignorance. So at that moment, we are consciousness choosing ignorance. That's what we are doing when we are in ignorance. We are consciousness choosing ignorance. We are consciousness holding ignorance for dear life. So we, as consciousness, we are the only one having a choice. We are the only one there is. Since we are in this activity of ignoring at this moment, the choice we have at this moment is to drop this activity. That's what we are doing. You see. So, as consciousness, when we are in ignorance, the only choice we have at that moment is to drop ignorance. Because that's what we are doing. And you say, it seems that in ignorance we can only act as if we are the chooser. No, that's what you are saying here is ignorance. With a proper understanding, you understand that since there is only one consciousness and that this consciousness is the real chooser, it is this consciousness that chooses ignorance and it is this consciousness that chooses to revert to knowing itself as that which it truly is, instead of knowing itself as an object, as a body-mind. So, you ask, is this correct? No, it wasn't correct. I hope I was clear. To sum it up, Pasha, uh, Pasha, uh, to sum it up, um, an ignorant person never chooses, never really chooses, because there is no such thing as an ignorant person. A limited consciousness never chooses, because there is no such a thing as a limited consciousness. Consciousness is unlimited, or it is something else than consciousness. So, Consciousness is the only chooser in all choosing situations. If we take ignorance as one of the choosing situations, in this situation, the, ch the choice that is offered to consciousness is to keep ignorance or to get rid of it at that moment. In other words, it's a two-dimensional Hilbert space. That's for Mr. Professor there. Not for you, Pasha, don't worry about what I have just said. It was a <laughs> private joke here. But the rest, I meant it.
Mandy asks, it occurs to me that looking for the intuition of reality is a little like looking for one's eyeglasses while wearing them. I heard when you once said this reality is self-evident and sense that the instruction to rest as presence may be a better way. Nevertheless, my enthusiasm sometimes get carried away and I find myself looking for this intuition until I catch myself doing this and smile and rest again. Am I on the right track or should I, in fact, be looking for it in some way? If you feel, if you feel you are separate from it, look for it. And then you go back to the understanding that you are it. You stop looking for it and you enjoy it. And you play this game for a while and at some point it will stabilize. I hope I was clear. And then second question. It also sometimes wonder, I also sometimes wonder whether it is solely habit and conditioning that pulls attention towards objects. Or does consciousness in its joy of its own creation also play a role in the tendency to go out while attempting to simply rest as awareness. Yes, the, the attention, the pull of attention towards object can, can, can have two interpretations, if you will. One is a desire to move away from consciousness, you know, not to experience consciousness, or a desire coming from happiness, from consciousness, to experience consciousness in its fullness that includes the objects. Because at the end of the day, the objects themselves are nothing else than consciousness. But although these two movements towards the object, in other words, the attraction, or the seeming attraction exerted by the object, uh, seem, seem, seems to be similar, these are two very different cases. In one case, it is an occultation of consciousness, a desire not to experience consciousness, to move away from it, to rest with the objects. So that's a movement away from consciousness towards the object. Whereas in the second case, it's a movement not away from consciousness, but from consciousness not away, fro away from, but from consciousness, resting as consciousness already, being consciousness already, but experiencing the creation as consciousness. So it uh, corresponds to an expansion from consciousness, to an expansion of consciousness, from consciousness without objects to consciousness with objects. In this case, we remain at the center. It's an expansion from the of the center, from the center. In the other case, it's an eccentric movement out of the center towards pseudo-centers.
Magdi says, when we are still in ignorance, is it at all possible to play tennis out of celebration? Or is celebration only possible when, we, when the task is complete, when we are abiding in and as consciousness? When we are in ignorance, is celebration at all possible? Yes, it is possible, but not to its fullest. It's a celebration. Celebration, it's possible during these moments when, as I said yesterday perhaps, ignorance takes a siesta. So while the parents are having a siesta, at least in, in Spain and countries like that, the kids can play in the street and do whatever they want. That's a moment of freedom. So that's the same thing. When the ignorance goes for a siesta, we can celebrate. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that ignorance is just asleep, it's not dead. So that the enjoyment is not complete. So that's but yes, there is a celebration and, and, and the joy that is uh, experienced in this celebration. Uh, is always uh, 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 an inkling of consciousness, of the experience of consciousness. Let me give you examples like that. For instance, an artist during artistic performance or during the artistic creative process, a scientist during the creative process, they experience a true joy. For, for, a, for a little while, they set aside their belief of being so and so, of being a man, being a woman, being a separate individual, being mortal, etc. For a while, they are just with, with that which they love to do. And in these moments, these are moments of celebration. But there is a bitter sweetness to it. The bitterness being the fact that ignorance is just asleep not dead. No more questions online, please. Okay. Pasha, Pasha. Oh, oh, she said, could I please leave my, save my question for another time? Oops, too late, Pasha. Well, thank you, uh, everybody.